Hi, brief intro. Today, one of Britain's most influential musicians. It's as simple as that. He's near, he's far, he's Johnny Marr. There he is. Hello. It certainly looks like Johnny Marr to me. <laughs> How are you? I'm all right, Rob. How are you? Nice to see you. I'm all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to see you too. And and I should tell you, because sometimes people are shocked. Sometimes they're not. We record from the get-go. Fine. Is that all right? Yeah, I better put my pants on. Well, no, we, we always go pantless. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Thanks for inviting me, Rob. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure, and I really like the new record. It's really lovely and hypnotic. I like that word, yeah. So I like songs, like everybody, and that might sound obvious, but uh, I think if you're going to use the word hypnotic, maybe there's a certain kind of headiness that I like in any kind of music. I love really great pop music, okay, but whatever it is, I like for it to be quite intense. And I say because another way of describing it would be would be psychedelic, but uh, uh, but I'm thinking about you saying hypnotic, but psychedelic, unfortunately, has these 60s connotations and a retro con connotation. Whereas I think what I try and do, naturally, I think, everything I sort of do is sort of imbued with a certain kind of headiness, no matter what it is, really. Uh, mm. No matter what kind of song. I like for it to be, if you were, happen to be awake at 3 a.m., uh, in a state of either refreshment or reverie or on your own, uh, I'd like for it to sound good, not whether it's a banger or whether it's a sort of more introspective song. Does that make sense? I like for it to be kind of intense and quite heavy, you know? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to introduce two other words now and, I, and I'm interested to get your reaction. Sonic landscape. Wow, okay. Wow, you would have made a, a, quite a good uh, VJ in the 90s. <laughs> well, do you know what? You're bringing me slowly up to date. I'm, I'm normally told I would have sat very comfortably in the 70s. So so, so I feel I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. There's nothing wrong with that, Rob. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that that's hip. But I think, no, uh, yeah, sonic landscape. Yeah, you need to, you need to be presenting Glastonbury. <laughs> you came to it young and you stuck with it young. Were you 11 when you picked up a guitar or a little bit older? No, when I actually picked up a guitar, I, was, I had a toy one morning, it was about five, five or six. And right. then my first one when my dad took me to get one that I was gonna be able to learn on, I was probably eight or nine. So I've been playing, I started putting chords together about eight or nine, started just oh. writing, trying to copy Mark Bolin riffs when I was about 10 or 11. Yeah. So for being a, a little boy, really, but then, as I say, I left school. I left school a year younger than I should have done at 15. I, I resigned from school. They, <laughs> they accepted my resignation. No problem. Because <laughs> uh, uh, what, what was happening at school then? What was happening academically? I'd stopped going. I moved from the inner city at 11. We, all, we, we moved from, yeah about five minutes away from downtown in Manchester, out to the suburbs. Uh, we all got re relocated in 1972. And um, the place I moved to was the biggest housing estate in Europe. Uh, and that sounds wow. a bit grim, but to me it was like, I would say this, it was like moving to Beverly Hills because compared to the inner city, it li literally was like, mum, what's that? That's called a tree, John. Really? Uh, and uh, wow. Yeah, because I lived really in the inner city and then I moved out to yeah. the suburbs and it was leafy and green. But the thing about it was that um, when I moved there, there were just loads of other kids my age, tons of them. And quite a few of them were, the thing to be was being bands. It was it was kind of uncanny, really. But the thing was, it was I sort of was a little sponge and, and I sort of would go wherever the music was and join these little bands. And I was always asked to be in bands and move around from thing to thing, which is a part of my MO to this day as an adult. Yeah, and yeah, um, yeah. anyway, point being is that um, there was uh, quite older boys, you know, a couple of years older, and they were a little more advanced and I wanted to learn from them. And I was hanging around, I was a little urchin running around with these older kids. 
So when it came to my school days, I was, my older mates had left. In, it, going to uni wasn't a thing where I came from, really. But in my case, my mates, they'd already left school. When, so when I got 14, 15, I was hanging out with them each night. We'd go up sitting around people's houses and we're listening to records and the rock music of the day, you know, whether it was Bowie or Bolin or, or you know, whoever. Bebop Deluxe, all these 70s bands, and we're all analysing the guitar playing. Uh, and they weren't, they were either hanging out, my mates were going to spend the next day hanging out in Virgin Records in town, um, yeah. or just loafing about. So that was what I was going to do. I, I, you know, I was a couple of years, I was quite precocious, so I was a couple of years beyond, beyond my years, if you like. I was just done with sitting there as a little schoolboy with my tie on. I was out of there, and plus, I'd already learned about sagging off school. I used to sag off school and go to um, go to Central Library. I used to spend a lot of my time in... And I, I got I was starting to sort of teach myself a lot of things, really. I used to just walk off school, Rob, and either hang out with my other mates who were already left school and, and play guitar and smoke pot in the afternoon, or I'd wander around on my own, looking at the buildings and, and hiding in Central Library and reading the music press. And one of the things... I'm not alone in this, which is amazing about pop culture, is I got really my education, the things I was really drawn to from my heroes, uh, my heroes' interviews. So Patti Smith had a massive impact on my life. And she used to talk about William Burroughs and the Romantics and Rambo. And so when I had to know all about that. So I read about Rambo and I read about yeah. William Blake. I found out about through... Patty Smith, and then this pan great Pandora's box opened then. And it, it being the late 70s by this time, my education, self-education, or, you know, I believe the word is autodidact, right? Um, yeah. Which I got through pop culture was hanging out in bookshops, nicking paperbacks, Philip K. Dick, uh, J.G. Ballard. From about 14, I learned a hell of a lot by not going to school. As a little kid, the Irish family and everything, the very first thing, I, a musical thing I was made to do really was play the harmonica everyone had to do a turn uh and i had a, and i love the sound of it and then i dropped it for years and years and then in uh around the time the smiths died i, I was very, really into the 60s rolling stones and brian jones and all of that so uh early days of the smiths i wanted to i thought i just got back into playing the harmonica so i ended up that's it's on the intro of the very first song single that we put out uh, but anyway, that time Angie just passed a test and I, 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 I'd invested in a harmonica and I stuck my feet up on the dashboard. We'd be driving around just for something <laughs> to do. She was only seven to 18, whatever. And I think back now, gee, that's like pulling a violin out and practice a violin or a saxophone <laughs> next to someone, just wailing harmonica. Yeah. Uh, a little, so, uh, she, you know, she must really love me. So there you go. And what you, so you've been with her since she was... What, around 17? No, she 14 and 15. She Angie was when wow. I met Angie, I was fi, I was 15 and she was 14. Yeah. How how do, how how do you make that work? Uh I'm not an idiot. Smartest move of my life. I, I know when I've got a good <laughs> thing, you know. Uh it, a lot's okay. made, been made of it over the years, which is very very lovely to me, you know. I've just, last week, I'd just come off tour, I was on tour with Blondie, so because of my book, um, I wrote about one of the one of the most amazing things that was that I was able to write about and, and finally let everyone know about it in detail was the moment I met Angie, right? You know, and uh, what, what started, it was 1979, um, and we've been together ever since. Uh, and um, and in it just so happened that in when we met, and what I wrote about was one of the details was in that moment of meeting her in this little party, this teenage party. I talked about the whole day, the leading up to it and all of that and what happened. Uh, there being a bus strike and me having to walk home for seven miles in the snow and getting, I've got pelted with eggs because I've been fired from the co-op and that was a ritual. It led up to this whole night. It's an tr entirely true story. And then by, by accident, I found myself at this party with these younger girls and Angie was there and it was, it was one of those moments like in a movie where the entire, I remember it really well, everyone else was just stood in freeze frame and there she was with a light round of that old bit. One of the details was that Parallel Lines was playing and then that's been mentioned 
to Debbie Harry and Chris Stein. We were doing some press together for the tour because it's part of my life story. And it was a really lovely thing to, to be talking to Debbie Harry about, you know, but I'm such an amazing part of my life. You know, she was liked the story as well. Debbie was asking me about it last week. I got to retell her that story and it was a nice moment. Completely forgot your question after all of that, but... Um, <laughs> No, listen, I love that. So you, you've you been very lucky, haven't you? Not, not lucky is not the word. F you've had good fortune in meeting the love of your life at that young age, right? And also the guitar at that young age and staying with both. Uh, I can't look at both, both those situations without getting very... Th that's an area where I will get cosmic and... Um, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's deep to me because the you know the the love of the guitar was something that I had from being a little boy. Uh, started you know being given this toy, being demanding this toy from this shop window that I used to be, I used to just look at this little object. So, so at that age, little kid, it, there's no concept of that'll make me famous, that'll get me girls, that's cool. You know, I, I don't know why I was so fixated on this object. And I used to carry that toy around everywhere. And all my aunties and uncles, where's your, where's your guitar, John? Oh, is that your guitar? You know, always with the guitar. This is a little toy thing. But then as you, you, you said something earlier about how you've, you've kind of, even at a young age, you kind of moved a, around musically or, or amongst friends. And then as you've gone on in, in your career, the, the film area is really interesting because that's a, that's a different world to rock and roll, is it not? Yeah, hugely. I, I've done a couple, few movies, a couple of movies. Nearly, see, I got very lucky because it, it's all down to Hans Zimmer, the great Hans Zimmer, who you know, very, very close friends with, and he first invited me. I'd already done a couple of other sort of not well-known films. I did a thing with Anthony Band Antonio Banderas, early two thousands, and the very first thing I did was back way back in the day on a Dennis Hopper movie, but that was sporadic. But this period that you're talking about of me doing film music has been really me and Hans Zimmer. And Hans is, do Johnny Marr. Oh, do your thing, do your <laughs> thing. Yeah. Now, was that was that first of all on Inception? Yeah. See, when I got to Inception and he, he first invited me, he's a very charming guy, Hans Zimmer. And he said to me, look, we've tried other, pe other people trying to do you. And we just, <laughs> and I was like, well... I know the musicians you've been trying and they're really technically brilliant. So I think you're just flattering me there. It, but actually, when I got to come and do the movie and I did my thing, I thought, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, it needs to sound the way I do it. That was an amazing experience, but it is very different to rock and roll. The fact that you have to please the director yeah. and is, is a really good thing. I like working. It, it's quite liberating being given restraints. Uh, when you yeah, we, we, we have boundaries and parameters to 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 work within. Yeah, uh, as you'll yeah. know as a writer. Um, yeah, yeah. So being given that remit is very good, and also doing what I do, music on films, you know straight away when it's gone down, when it's not working. You know, it, it needs to. It can do a number of things if a scene is a certain way. If you if you concentrate, depending on which aspect of it, which actor you want to sort of you you want to focus on, or whatever it. You know, it can be in opposition. So there's all these different things you can try, but you know when it's not working. And that's right. that's great. Yeah. So that's very different from making your own music. And um, and I love it. The films I've been working on. Yeah. Now this is, let, we should just remind people, this is Fe Fe Fever Dreams Parts 1 to 4. And didn't Rob Bryden, and he's very good, didn't he describe it as hypnotic? It's that hypnotic record, yeah, you know, it's... Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> I, I think you'll find the, the nod from Rob Brydon, um, especially if he were to say it as Michael Caine, you know, would, is, you know, I've been listening, I've been listening to Johnny Marr's new record, and I will say there is only one word to describe it, and that word is hypnotic. And I don't want to hear any dissenting voices. I can retire now. Michael Caine has described my record as hypnotic. I wish yeah, uh, I wish yeah. I'd known that before I'd done it. Who'd have known that it would have touched Michael so profoundly? <laughs> I think the next time you see Michael, you should thank him because uh, 
You know, maybe he'll come and see you with the killers. When does that tour start? Mid-August it starts. And where does that take you? It's all the way through America. So that's wow. that's for our, our you know our stateside friends. But so it's, it's around yeah. it's around all thirty odd cities in in America. So uh, that that's going to happen. Well, it has been really really lovely talking to you, Johnny. Thank you for 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 giving us your time. Well, no, that, it's been lovely talking to you, Rob. That, so, uh, apologies if I get if I got a bit too cosmic, but there you go. I've loved it. You created a lovely sonic landscape. <laughs> Thanks a lot, mate. See you at Glastonbury. See you, man.